Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's in-depth ag forecast brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. First of all, sorry I'm coming to you a little bit later than normal tonight. Uh, I was in Manhattan, Kansas earlier today talking to a great group, and it just took me about nine and a half hours to get home. But I, I did want to show you something. Uh, I was talking out there about some of the severe weather that we can often get in the plains, and I mentioned that I do have a mold of the 1970 Coffeyville, Kansas hailstone. It's one of my prized possessions, and so I just wanted to show everybody that was at that meeting today that this is what it looks like. But one of the big topics we got into a discussion about was drought, and we got a new drought monitor update today, and it's actually shown us that we've seen some drought expansion throughout the plains, and given how dry things have also been in the west since the beginning of the year, we're now getting very concerned about what is still left in the tank in terms of atmospheric flow that could really uh, really help and revive the west coast. We need to talk about those two areas specifically, but let's just do this real quick. I'd like to come in here and look at the change maps, and let's just try to see where drought has expanded in the most recent update. So you can see it's right been in here in Kansas and Oklahoma, parts of Iowa, Missouri, and then of course over here in the southwest. There's been pockets elsewhere, but our bigger picture threat with all of this is that over the last three months, you know, we continue to see this, this becoming a problem. So I'm going to talk about these two areas specifically to here to get us started. Now, when we look at the soil moisture values, we've got to remember that this is still a bit early in the season, but we are actively planting a crop down in parts of southern Texas right now. And uh, so looking at some of these soil moisture values, we need to start thinking about rains getting back into this area. But it extends through the central plains and into the western Corn Belt. And we've noticed lately that it's been getting quite dry along the Gulf Coast and even over here in the coast of Carolinas and Virginia. Those are a few areas that we need to just keep a very close sign as we progress forward. Just to show you again the stats, uh, month to date, or excuse me, year to date, uh, this is how um, precipitation ranks by climate districts are shaping up. And just a reminder, where we see that number 130, that would be um, where in this data set we would find the driest start to this uh, to a year on record. So a lot is going on out in the west. We need to keep a close eye on and in the western Corn Belt. Where it's been extremely wet has been from the mid-south into New England. And uh, we're about to see quite a bit more precipitation coming through that area. Now, one of the problems we're going to continue to see is this color in through here is all red flag warning. While we have flood warnings in the Mid-South, uh, right around where the Ohio and Mississippi come together and all their tributaries, uh, we have red flag warnings for fire uh, in the West. Now, just to show you what we've seen over the last 14 days, the last two weeks, that Mid-South region, getting into the Tennessee Valley, northern Mississippi and Alabama, we've got a lot of places in here that just in the last two weeks alone, alone have seen, uh, in some places, more than five inches uh, in surplus of, of rainfall. And while that pattern is set up, it's really kind of robbed much of the plains, and it's really hit California quite hard. We've been very hard-pressed to get a good atmospheric river event that would be just southwest flowing the jet stream to come in to California. Now, one of the big trends we watched uh, over the last about seven or eight days is that the earlier projections of the MJO coming out of the Indian Ocean and heading here into phases of four and five began to collapse pretty quickly in the forecast models. And now we're getting pretty weak signals as we go forward with the MJO coming back over here into kind of a reset mode, going back into null space. So that just tells us that we don't have a really well-defined area of deep convection in some place from Africa all the way just north of Australia into the Central Pacific Ocean. I need you to keep that in mind here in a few moments that the MGO is going right into this area as we do this analysis for the Southern Plains and the West Coast. So what do we end up seeing? If there is good rising motion, it's somewhere over here in phases four, five, and six. So it's just north of Australia, but it's not as though it's as well defined as we can typically get this time of year. So what I'm, why I'm watching this is because what we've developed over the last, uh, it's been about 10 days now, has been an extended Pacific uh, jet. See here, it's just really cranking off of the Himalayas, coming across China, and it's been breaking up uh, over the last few days here in the Gulf of Alaska and just to the east of Hawaii. So that's the split. Now the good thing about having the split this far into the Pacific Ocean is that we're getting waves, short waves like these, that are coming into the West Coast, bringing in precipitation to that area. But what, what I'm concerned about is, does this extended Pacific jet start to um, break apart? Does it start to weaken? And what does that mean in terms of the redevelopment, the potential redevelopment of some ridging over the West Coast? Because of the lack of a signal coming right now from the MJO, I'll just make a point to say that I don't have very much confidence. I don't have good confidence here in the long-range forecast I'm about to share with you. So what is it showing? 
Well, this is how things are shaping up at the end of the month. Now we're looking down on top of the planet right here in the North Pole. You can see that the coldest air, uh, you know, over the North Pole is sitting somewhere here in the Canadian archipelago. Now the models at this point are not, you can see it, they're not advertising major positive height anomalies or ridges across the West. In fact, they're keeping a lot of what would appear just to be more zonal flow like this. Now we know that when we look out this far, we're getting an ensemble average. It's not showing the individual features. So I'm just looking for the big defining features of this. But what is missing is any sense of a subtropical jet stream coming in this direction. And that's why if we just shift this around, let's go down to a US view, look at that 30 day time period. And I'll just, I'll just play this out. Gosh, we can go all the way up to the 15th. You know, because of that, we're missing out on better flow into the West, which means the likelihood of this, you know, a, a drought curing miracle March or amazing April is waning. The, uh, the possibility of that, we're going to get precip, but not the kind that's going to just completely relieve all of our drought concerns. While it'll be wet in the Northwest and again, staying very active from the Mid-South into the New England area, hitting a lot of the Eastern Corn Belt, the models did come in uh, quite a bit drier for Texas. So what do we need to be watching here? What, what could be a signal that this is going to be wrong? And I want to talk specifically about these southern plains where we've seen drought continue to expand. Because we know because it's La Nina, we're not going to get that strong flow, that those, those big atmospheric rivers to hammer into California. Um, so what we're going to get is going to be less than normal precip. But come back here to the southern plains, okay? When I take a look at Texas, and I went back, all the way to 1895 and looked at March through April total precipitation. Now this is March through April, right? We have seen an upward trend since the 1970s, but a lot of variability. So when you rank these and look for the wettest years, we can then see what has to happen to return that moisture. So first of all, let's go right up there to the mid levels of the atmosphere and look for those troughs and ridges. And it turns out, take a look at this trio of ridges. One, two, three. That setup right there in that spacing tends to build a southeast ridge that allows better flow of moisture coming right back in to Texas. In other words, we're going to move the, the, the dry line, the edge of the rain shadow, back farther west, delivering more Gulf moisture. Now, unfortunately, if Texas ends up getting this pattern, California is completely robbed of the right wind direction they would need. All right. What does the MGO have to do? Well, sitting in null space isn't any good. And also coming back out over here, where we currently think it's going to be for the next 15 days, isn't the right place either. You see, we most often get those ridges showing up when the MGO goes over to phase 7 or phase 8. And I've been talking to folks in California saying, you, you don't want it over here. You actually want the MGO to come right back over somewhere in the Indian Ocean so that if it does that, we extend the jet, get better flow into California, but unfortunately, it would appear that neither of these two scenarios are going to happen. And the MGO is going to hang out somewhere in the middle. And that's why when you look at the forecast, we just tend to see that both areas continue to show up on the drier side of things. In other words, the MJO is not connecting the jet stream in a way that's going to deliver the moisture to either location. Now, just thinking about this further, I also want to point out that given the current state of our La Nina, where it is coldest over in Nina region one plus two, that's very much near uh, South America, that we should historically expect that we're gonna be drier than normal in a big section here in the mid part of the country. It's also drier in through here and, and drier into the west as well as you go into April and May. If we were experiencing an El Nino event, we would expect it to be quite wet. So that's another component of this that we have to pay attention to because this region right now uh, is still showing up with a fading La Nina. All right. So we, we kind of use all that to piece together why the models are giving us this look. And we also have to remember that one of the big defining features of winter and early spring has been the MJO. And it finally just pulled away and is no longer giving us a strong signal. So that's why my confidence isn't overly high. All right. Now, what we are seeing in the next few days, I'm building better confidence in. And that's going to be watching this short wave, sorry, this short wave right here. And this one that just came through California finally eject into the plains. Because when they do, first problem is going to be pretty windy conditions here with not much precip. So that's why we saw that this part of, uh, excuse me, of um, New Mexico and Texas is under 
uh, the red flag warnings to dry uh, as this thing comes on shore. In fact, I just want to show it to you. Let's blow this up. But even by the time we get into Saturday, see where the edge of the really high moisture air is? It's here. So we've just we built in into this deeper trough too much dry air that's not allowing the moisture return to come back into the central plains and instead focusing it here, well, as far north as Iowa, where we could see some severe weather, but certainly going to be pushing into the Mid-South as we go through the weekend. All right. So what that gives us is this picture. And this is the next seven days of precip. I'm going to go ahead and just use the European model. We do have the deeper troughs coming into the west. We're going to get one wave that ejects here first. There'll be a second one that comes out at the end of the weekend there, and a third one that comes out down here early next week. And it's in all three of those arrows that we're going to be seeing the best chances of precipitation. There's a big Arctic high sitting here right now. And one of the issues with this Arctic high is that over this week, it has trended a bit stronger. While it is going to deliver much needed snow, I'll show you that in a moment, to parts of southern Alberta and Saskatchewan, that's an area that's been in snow drought, it has peeled back the better snows that we thought we would see in this part of the northern plains. That's just been the trend that we've noticed here in the models. But let's kind of walk through each one of these regions really quickly, starting in the west. European model into that deeper trough, you can see that while we're looking at generally less than an inch of liquid equivalent in the Sierra Nevadas, there are a few places throughout the Rockies and the Cascades where we're going to be seeing better overall moisture. And that's why that's where we expect over the next seven days to see our highest snow totals. So this is good. I like to see this snowpack coming in here into the mountains, but we needed a lot more in the Sierra Nevada and in the Cascades. And we're just not getting that out of this kind of lack of strong onshore flow. From there, why don't we go to the midsection of the country? Now, this is an area that doesn't need another drop of rain right now, this part of the Mid-South into the Eastern Corn Belt. Yet these next couple of systems rolling through could bring in anywhere between an inch and a half and up to three inches of rainfall, maybe more locally. And the concern is going to be in this area that we are going to see the river flooding continue to get worse and a lot of standing water in fields as we press forward. So expect to see flood watches issued through this whole region as we go forward. But notice how dry we are on the backside. That's been the problem going over toward a drier forecast here. And our latest outlook for snow, just kind of zooming in on the Midwest here, models have really kind of pulled back on those amounts. Now, this is an operational run from the European model, and we're just kind of getting an idea here on where the heavy snow is going to be. I think the best thing to do is to take this and look at it a couple different ways. First, I love seeing snow in here, but there's not much liquid equivalent in this. And that's an area that we know throughout this year has been lacking in a big way for snowfall and desperately needs it. I'm talking about the whole of the Missouri River Basin, just missing out on a lot of this. Now, when you look at the next 10 days, just to point out a couple of things, better snows here. We need that. In this area, there is a decent chance between 70 and almost 100 percent of getting at least three inches in this corridor. And the probabilities have increased right in through here as well with this next system that's coming out. We do have an ice threat to the north, okay, coming through parts of Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan, and into Ontario and Quebec. But this right now looks to be the corridor of where we could get the heaviest snows going forward. And the operational run uh, kind of hints on that too. One last area before we get into the multi-model analysis is going to New England. There's that snow swath right in through here that we just talked about. And total precipitation, boy, it's still getting wet into New England. We've seen it's been quite wet there as of late, but it's great to see moisture finally returning down here into the southeast. And I want to show you how all this comes together by doing our, our multi-model analysis. First, we do have a severe weather threat that's going to come up on Saturday and then again on Sunday. Storm Prediction Center has been honing in on this area in Iowa, kind of focused on Iowa, where we could have the best chance of, of probably having even storms that rotate. I think the greatest threat right now is going to be straight line winds, but we're going to have to watch this carefully. Then, as you look at our kind of uh, severe thunderstorm index, this is Saturday. As we then go into Sunday, the severe storm threat is going to go back. Let's just kind of stop it here about 6 o'clock. We're going to watch this area down here as possibly having the greatest risk for seeing some of those strong to severe storms. So as we've now kind of looked at this in pieces, let's pull it all together with our multi-model analysis. Got the GFS over there on the left and the European on the right. Okay, we've got the deeper trough developing in the west. We see the cutoff low going into California. There's our good snow sitting on the edge of that Arctic high in the Canadian prairie. So what we're watching for here is as we go through the day on, on Friday into Saturday morning, 
and Saturday midday, the first of these systems emerges in the plains, and the models have it pretty well locked down here. Again, we're going to watch on Saturday evening for this corridor to have the severe storms. Certainly going to be some very strong winds around this. Snow on the backside. Now that system quickly goes through the Great Lakes by Sunday morning, presses into kind of the Canadian Maritimes in New England by Sunday evening. So that's what we're watching there. The second shortwave is now coming out down here, and it's putting more of a train in eastern Oklahoma and into eastern Kansas and into Missouri and Arkansas, and you can see it in the, in the European as well. And then that one presses through the eastern Corn Belt and mid-south, dumping a lot of rain, and it also spreads that snow into New England. So you can see right there through Monday night into Tuesday where the heavy snow band is going to be. Now, I told you there's a third system and the models are picking up on that one here late Tuesday into Wednesday. See it showing up down here? Uh, the GFS is a bit slower, which is interesting, than the European, but it's all because the GFS has much higher pressure sitting off the coast than the European does. But they both have a system down here next Tuesday, Wednesday time frame that's going to deliver that rain to the southeast. Now, normally we don't take these operational models much beyond a week. They tend to not exhibit good skill, but watch this. If we go out there to next Thursday, it is interesting to see that both the models next Thursday into Friday develop yet another wave that comes through the Midwest. Now we won't see the details on this, but it's important to see that it's there. Beyond that, this is what the jet stream pattern looks like once we get out there to mid-March. Now this trough is going to deliver quite a bit of cold air, but with flow coming in out of the Northwest in late winter, early spring, the best action is going to be to the south of it and on the eastern side of this broader trough. So what we're going to get out of this is drier from California back into the southern plains with all the action coming in the northwest and then down here in the southeast to New England. That's the week two precipitation anomalies and the GFS ensemble looks very similar to that. So where do we go from here? Let's talk temperatures. Now we've had some incredibly warm weather. In fact, when I drove through Kansas City on uh, what was that, Wednesday, 85 degrees is what I got. But we saw the temperatures like this on Thursday. What does it look like on Friday? Another big warm-up, but this is now the warm-up that happens out ahead of that big storm system. So on Saturday, now you see the temperature contrast. The deeper trough in the west, the cold front advancing through the plains. This is Sunday. Warmth moves east, getting into Monday. And by Tuesday, we've got more of that cold air getting all the way down to the Gulf Coast and over to the east. Now, you still see a lot of 50s and 60s, but for this point in March, that's, that's cold compared to average. We also know this, that the longer range extended um, models, those that take us out about 15 days, are keeping, um, you know, they're keeping quite a bit of cold air around for the middle of the month, anchored right there in the Canadian Prairie and Northern Plains. So that's day 5 through 10, and this is day 10 through 15. Don't expect the end of the month to look like this. I expect the pattern to fluctuate quite a bit. And I know on Monday I talked a bit about the polar vortex. Let's finish with that, because the polar vortex is going to split piece of it's going to go here just to the east of the Hudson Bay, another one over Russia. But what happens with the model forecast now is out there past maybe the 8th, 9th, and 10th, it seems as though the polar vortex kind of gets its act back together and comes and sits back over here as a pretty well-defined vortex, which means I'm not expecting a disruption to be a major problem at this point. But with that, I'm going to wrap it up. I appreciate you giving me some extra time tonight as I drove home. Have a good rest of your week, and we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks.